We've covered many a game, movie, and etc. here on What Happened, but we haven't tackled anything quite like the story that we'll be discussing today. There's a distinct lack of last-minute engine switches, a meddling publisher, or a particular someone at the fulcrum point of all the troubles. Instead, we'll be talking about one of the greatest, most innovative, and most ambitious RPGs ever made that simply came out at the wrong time and at the wrong place, or uh, console. This is the story of Panzer Dragoon Saga, a game that quite simply was too beautiful for this world. It's 1995 and Sega has just launched its first expedition into outer space, ultimately targeting the planet Saturn, which many feel was a massive mistake in retrospect. But its initial launch in 95 went reasonably well. They had flashy ports of Virtua Fighter in Daytona USA, a novel platformer in Clockwork Knight, and most importantly for this story, Panzer Dragoon. Yes, it was a rail shooter for all intents and purposes, but was the brainchild of young up-and-coming designer Yukio Futatsugi, who once had aspirations to be a filmmaker. He and the team he led, dubbed Andromeda, were able to squeeze a lot of impressive 3D performance out of the Saturn, as well as work in some clever effects that gave the game an unmistakable ethereal quality. While rail shooters tend to provide basic fun, Dragoon had an elegant and even emotive tone to it, with its synergistic marriage between action and music, as well is hinting at a mysterious civilization. You only ever got glimpses of this world as you flew by on Dragonback, so it definitely left a lot of things to the imagination of the player. Thankfully, Team Andromeda had a hit on their hands, and Dragoon wound up being an early showpiece for the Saturn. But like many other games where shooting was done via rails, it was all but too brief and didn't have many incentives for multiple playthroughs. Still though, Sega of Japan was pleased with the game's reception and early sales, and thus the team was set to expand, with two titles being greenlit and worked on at the same time. One a traditional sequel, and the other an entirely different beast altogether. Panzer Dragoon 2's way featured better graphics, branching paths, customizable dragons, and even had unlockables and secrets to entice fans to replay it. The core team members were largely those that worked on the first game, and since it was a straightforward sequel, it let Futatsugi concentrate on the much bigger project, Panzer Dragoon Saga, or Anzol Panzer Dragoon RPG in Japan. This might shock you, given in that title, but Saga was designed to be a full-blown RPG set in the Dragoon universe, a real-time, 3D, fully voice-acted RPG filled with over an hour of cinematics on the Sega Saturn in the mid-90s. This was just about the most technically and artistically ambitious thing they could have set out to make. I mean, for the time, I suppose making a massive open world FPS RTS hybrid would have been a bit harder, if not impossible, given the technology. This ambitious plan was because with Square's massively hyped RPG Final Fantasy VII being massively hyped as a big exclusive for Saturn rival the PlayStation, the head of Sega, Hayao Nakayama, felt firing back with their own big RPG was going to be critical in gaining ground. So the project would need to be all the things Final Fantasy wasn't doing, but of course with much less of a budget and with a team that had never made an RPG before. Now while all of this was certainly a noble goal, it would lead to one of the most arduous development cycles of the 1990s. So much so that in 2018 Futetsugi was quoted saying, even now when I run into problems I think, well, at least this isn't as hard as when we were developing Panzer Dragoon Saga. A lot of new info about the game's long road to completion comes from an article at The Ringer, written by Ben Lindbergh, who spoke with former members of Team Andromeda who had swelled to over 40 plus and had worked almost around the clock for three years straight on the game. This was not typical in the 90s as most development teams usually ranged in the average of about a dozen to two dozen 
vision for a big 3D project. That was, however, what Sega felt needed to happen in order to produce a dazzling game on their first 3D system and to hopefully push some consoles out the door. Their previous gambles, the Sega CD and 32X, let's just say, didn't pan out, so they were desperate for a hit that would finally move some hardware. This importance was also doubly so because many classic Sega mascots and franchises made popular on the Genesis slash Mega Drive wound up missing the trip to planet Saturn for various reasons that usually always amount to Sega being Sega. There was no Sonic, Altered Beast, Streets of Rage, Echo, and of course, um, no experts. Therefore, they were very keen to foster new franchises instead, although how successful they were remains uh, pretty definitively not very. The idea of expanding the universe Futetsugi had created with an RPG specifically came from his producer and boss, Yoji Ishii, and while everyone was on board, they all soon came to a realization. No one had ever attempted something like this before. While Square were still dropping polygonal characters onto static 2D backgrounds and relying solely on text for their story, Team Andromeda set out to create backgrounds, props, characters, dragons, just everything in full 3D, which was nothing short of crazy on the Saturn, which was always designed to handle scaling sprites and 2D art a little more smoothly. So everything they were attempting here was nothing short of trailblazing from a design point of view, and that extended to the presentation as well. Saga would be entirely voiced in Japanese, and have a smattering of cutscenes that featured the constructed language Panzerese. That's due, the Olangus Impenia Banais, the Gerdem Ergaterium. Dragoon 1 and 2 featured it as well, but the team felt its inclusion here was essential to keep things authentic and unique. 90 minutes of pre-rendered CGI cutscenes would also be produced to flesh out the story, which was again incredibly ambitious when compared to other games at the time, which typically offered brief snippets, intros, endings, stuff like that. While Team Andromeda had produced some for the previous two games, an hour and a half was a huge increase in the workload. All of these aspects were things that Final Fantasy wouldn't even attempt until almost four years later, and on a new generation of hardware. It's no surprise that Saga, which was scheduled for 1997, was further delayed into 1998. Unfortunately, this decision was also something that would go on to be a death blow, not just for the project, but the team itself. The idea of a big RPG being completed in just three years nowadays seems scoffable at best, but in the 90s, three plus years spent on only one title was an Ice Age, and during said Ice Age, Sega upper management began to realize that the Saturn's sales outlook wasn't getting any better, but rather much, much worse. Competition from Nintendo and especially Sony was fierce, and the original high price point of Sega's machine and lack of any true marquee titles saw it vastly underperform when compared to the N64 and the mighty PlayStation single ballin'. For Team Andromeda though, they just focused on making the best game they could, and since no no one had ever attempted to make an RPG in this style before, everything needed to be made from scratch. A fully 3D RPG with beautiful visuals, that kind of game hardly existed anywhere in the world, which meant that no matter what aspect of the game we worked on, we had the challenge of making it entirely from whole cloth said Futatsugi in the Ringer interview. They couldn't use any technology or code elsewhere from within Sega's libraries or from any other teams, as they were figuring things out as they went along. With no real templates to work off of, and with the team having no experience working within RPG conventions, they decided to cut out a lot of the superfluous mechanics and bloat. There was certainly a cast of characters in Panzer Dragoon Saga, but you only ever controlled two. Mercenary Edge and a wild dragon which befriends him. While Edge could attack enemies, he could also call his dragon down to swoop overhead to doll out special attacks, and they could do as many actions in whatever order they wanted as long as their gauge still had some uh, 
Panzerjuice in it. This led to a very freeform fighting system. No, no, not that one. That again did away with the turn-based nature seen in pretty much every other RPG on the market. The main plot was basic but focused. Edge takes it upon himself to save a mysterious kidnapped girl by the name of Anzel, who seemed to have origins dating back to ancient times. Since party management was not really a thing, you only ever had to worry about the two characters, it let Team Andromeda pay special attention to all those other aspects I outlined earlier. So there was a less cluttered cast of characters, very little in the way of menu navigation, and completely cut out the slow starts, which are indicative of a lot of RPGs. Instead of waking up in a forest and killing level 1 rats for a few hours until you get to the first town, you are almost instantly taking on giant monsters and doing dungeon plunging with your dragon as soon as control is given to the player. They also made the conscious decision to cut out things like fetch quests and pretty much eliminate the need to grind. However, this all leads back to those long hours I mentioned before, and Sega management and Futetsugi himself had no experience in leading a team as large as they had working on Saga. When the core team assigned to Zwei had finished up, they then joined the new employees that had started started work on Saga the year previous. Unfortunately, since that new staff had no experience working on any Dragoons, it inevitably led to conflicts among the ranks. Sega upper management then put pressure on Futetsugi to continually rally the troops to keep them on track with deadlines, even if it meant being a bit demanding. I was exhausted, the team was exhausted, and since there were a lot of people on the team to deal with the massive volume of work, and at the time there wasn't as much management know-how for handling large projects, there was a lot of pressure to domineer over the staff. I remember being pretty rough on them too. As the months dragged on, Team Andromeda had to face more personal tragedies in the lead up to launch. Two staff members, one of them holding a senior position, passed away suddenly. One death via a motorcycle accident and another via suicide. While these deaths obviously affected the game, they left a lasting effect on the remaining staff and Futetsugi even more. The passing of our staff members produced a huge shock in all of us. One of the persons who died had a close relationship relationship with me, so their loss affected me for a long time. Now, over on the other side of the Pacific, Sega of America had the added challenge of translating Panzer Dragoon for their side of the globe, which wasn't exactly easy. Sega's overall decline in the late 1990s left this once prominent part of the company, the American one, completely gutted, going from over 2,000 employees to just 200. This left many franchises, which were popular in the West, out in the cold which we've covered once or twice on this channel before. Thus, it was up to just two people to localize the game, and unfortunately, the Saturn was doing far, far worse in the rest of the world when compared to Japan. Final Fantasy VII's stellar success, selling over 10 million copies worldwide, was enough for Sega to start already planning their next console to try to combat the rise of Sony's dominance. Again, something I've covered before. Chris Lusich and Matt Underwood were the those two Sega of America employees, and quickly became enraptured with the builds of Saga that were coming in, astounded at the work Team Andromeda were putting in. Therefore, they tried their absolute best to adapt it for Western audiences, knowing full well that by the time the game actually released, very few people would ever even play it. We worked every night until 4am to get it all done. I actually had severe bronchitis on the last day it was in test, and I was sent home. I wanted to be there for the end, but I was coughing up blood, literally. I was trying to tell people, no, I, I'm good. Such was the fervor, the belief that Panzer Dragoon Saga was something special, something truly groundbreaking and worthy of praise. But the problem was that Sega was already moving on, diverting resources and budget to the then upcoming Dreamcast, which as an overall move for the company was smart, but it had the unfortunate side effect of leaving any remaining remaining Saturn projects by the wayside. 
While disagreements and friction between the old and new staff members continued up until the Japanese launch of the game and Chris and Matt burning the midnight oil to get the localized version done, it fortunately wasn't all for naught. Upon its release, Panzer Dragoon Saga garnered some truly incredible reviews, with many outlets saying it was among the best RPGs ever made, with some magazines scoring it higher than Final Fantasy VII. Now, as good as that must have felt to all the people who put their blood blood, sweat, and tears into the project, it unfortunately didn't translate to sales. While the Saturn's waning popularity was certainly a factor, the available shelf space in toy and electronic stores was a shadow of what it used to enjoy, the massive switch in genre from rail shooter to RPG probably confused a number of gamers as well. Imagine if, say, a new Virtua Cop suddenly shifted to an RPG. There would definitely need to be a period of acclimatization. In Japan, Anzel Panzer Dragoon RPG shifted somewhere in the neighborhood of 100,000 copies. Sales data from this time is notoriously hard to pin down, but numbers in the rest of the world were far more dismal. Roughly 25,000 copies were ever even produced for North America, as Saturn game manufacturing was on its way out. Complicating matters was the fact that to fit in all that CGI and speech, Saga was a four-disc game, so the decision to limit the amount of copies produced was probably also a financial one. And if that doesn't depress you, then this certainly will. Europe only ever received 1,000 copies, making it one of the rarest games in that region. While not expressly due to the low sales, and certainly not due to the quality of the product, Sega still disbanded Team Andromeda soon after, folding much of them into Smile Bit as more of a belt-tightening measure. Sega did a lot of restructuring around this time in order to put as much money and resources into the Dreamcast's upcoming debut as they could, and Andromeda was one of those teams sacrificed for that dream. Fortunately, however, the world of Panzer Dragoon didn't stop there, as Smilebit then produced the stellar and much more traditional sequel, Panzer Dragoon Orta, for the Xbox in 2002, which can still be played on modern Xbox consoles today. It even includes a rock-solid port of the game that started it all, but sadly, no Zway too, and even more sadly, no Saga. Not long after Order's release, Fudetsugi moved on to Konami, then Microsoft where he helped shape the world of Phantom Dust until he founded Grounding Inc. in 2007. While his first title, the codenamed Project Draco, was cancelled for the Xbox 360, it moved over to the Xbox One and was redubbed to Crimson Dragon, which was clearly meant to invoke the Panzer titles of old. While an admirable attempt, it didn't exactly win over many critics, and I can't fathom why. While Futetsugi had hoped the game would be a big enough success to inspire sequels, that obviously didn't pan out, which was a shame because he had plans to spin it off into an RPG as well. His most recent project is collaborating with Swery65 on The Good Life, which seems to be on track for release in 2021. As for the Panzer Dragoon remake, well, Sega commissioned relatively unknown developer Megapixel to head it up, and while it was a Switch exclusive for a time, it's now releasing across a variety of formats. Futetsugi, however, was not involved with its creation. Unfortunately, the takeaway from all of this is that while some Panzer Dragoon games have been preserved, Sega doesn't really acknowledge the Saturn era games all that much, digitally or otherwise. Nowadays, factory sealed copies of Saga retail for thousands of dollars, and non-complete versions usually in the hundreds. The Saturn is also hard to emulate accurately, so no matter how you slice it, experiencing Panzer Dragoon's sublime and unique foray into the realm of the RPG is notoriously difficult in the hellscape of 2020. Now while on that subject, it's been rumored but never confirmed that Sega simply lost the source code during the closure of Team Andromeda and its big 90s reshuffling. Now while this rumor certainly has some credence, other assets and materials for other franchises 
prizes were indeed lost and or discarded, Futetsugi himself has said he doesn't know the whole truth of it. And who knows, maybe someone will find the source code laying around on a CD somewhere. This is one of those rare stories where the development, while certainly tough and filled with moments of doubt and uncertainty, still persevered and resulted in an incredible product, but due to factors simply outside the developer's control, never found a significant audience. Futetsugi recalls, I wanted to create something with permanence, something that would remain in the hearts of the group of people I made the game for, something for those who were starving for a new experience, something that could stay fresh and unique 10 years after its release, something that doesn't look like any other game. And in that, he very much succeeded, even if very few people ever got to experience it. If you know of any other tragically tragic tales of developmental tra tra tragedy, let me know in the comments below, soar on over to my Twitter, and feel free to check out the new line of What Happened Focus merch I just launched. Link in the description below. And if you want to nominate the subject of your choosing for me to hoist onto our stage, become a big boss down at the Flophouse VIP Patreon. See you next time, and thanks for watching.